Hello and welcome to According to John. Today, our topic is a little heavy, but I think we'll be okay and work through it because so many people right now are struggling. The question is, is it okay to want to die? Five words come to my mind from the book of Esther for such a time as this. Six words, excuse me. <laughs> for you know, such a time is this. As Six this. Words. As this, that's as right. This. Six as words. <laughs> These are not easy days. They're not. I was in our senior Bible study. I've been teaching for like 14 years, and the topic of martyrdom came up. Now, these are people that have been in the Scriptures for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. They right. love God. They're, they're not fearful, but they're listening to the news. They're very up on Bible prophecy. They've been expecting the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They know the evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They believe those days are here, and they're beginning to think, is martyrdom something that we may be facing? That's crazy. And yeah. so I know you have some scriptures I mean, here it's, to it's, frame it's, this it's, out. Yeah, it's crazy, but it's a reality. Yeah. You're going to capture the essence of our day. Not fun, but we, we are the resistance. Right. <laughs> we are God's chosen people mm -hmm. for such a time as this. Yeah. We're listening to some horrific things happening around the world. Uh, there's uh, governments closing in on their populace. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ has never been welcomed, especially in communistic, dictatorial type of governments. I mean, history repeats itself. And so, these did you ever think, though, that you would see America in such distress? Never, never. And I've not been, like this. I've been here sixty-seven years, and people say, "Well, are these times as as bad as it was in the late 60s with all the racial things?" I'm like, "Oh my goodness, it's a thousand times worse." It's way worse. Well, because uh, it's one thing, you know, you when you have all the racial tension and so on and so forth, but right now you have the racial tension, you have the censorship, you have political correctness, you have if you you know you can't say he she anymore. Yeah, you have the gender. I mean, you gender. can't even call it breast milk anymore. You have to call it um, a chest milk. Wow, wow, unprecedented times. Careful how you use your pronouns. You right. could be labeled a hate monger. Uh, how do you call someone an it or Z or Z or whatever it is when you grew up calling them a she or a he? You know, another thing is in our face. If you shop. You go to the stores and the, they're not they're not uh, provided for supplied like they were. There's empty. Try to get uh, right. canning jars. Try to get canning lids. Try to. There's so many different things that uh, the supply chain is breaking down, and people are being wise to this. Gas prices are uh, fifty percent higher than they were a year ago in, in most parts of the country, and so they're unprecedented. Well, days. and how about this? How about medical right now? They're in this called medical donut or something. Like now these elderly got to spend $6,000 to get a $6 discount. I mean, it's, it's insane yeah. where they're at and everything is off the chart and people are going to, they're, they're struggling. Yeah. We can go on and on about the fearful things that we're facing, the coming uh, world economic summit, uh, the global financial reset. What's that going to look like? Oh uh, so they're unprecedented days. I know we have a scripture that kind of frames this up. Let's jump into that. Yeah, let's, well, that's more cheery than. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, hey, I am your host, John Westfall. This is my co-host, Pastor Duke Herget, the Duke Meister. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we're going to get started on this because we really want to encourage you and not discourage you. But we also recognize that we are in unprecedented times and that people are struggling like never before. Yeah, yeah. And the scriptures acknowledge that. And we do have good news. We have great news. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. We love you, Father. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Father, thank you that none of this is a surprise to you. That's right. And I just pray, Father, that you would use us, speak through us, that we would help those that are struggling rather than discourage. And Father, that we would show people that they're not alone. But, Father, you've not left us alone either, Father, that Amen. you love us, you're here for us, and that, Lord, that you 
will provide a way. Father, help us to show that in the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the passages that really set this off, and and the fact that so many people have asked, uh, Pastor, I just want to die. Is that okay? Yeah. And, and I'm like, I get it. But no, it's not. Okay. I never, I don't know that I ever heard that until this past year. Yeah. Think and about that. I've heard that. I've heard that a number of times this year. Great people. Great people, but they're tired yeah, yeah, and, just, and they're looking for the return yeah. of Christ. Luke chapter 21 verses 25 through 28. Is, All of it discourse. Jesus was asked, when are you going to return? And he said, this is what you can expect. Yeah. And this is spot on. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near." So the, the thing that is perplexing is in verse 26, men's heart failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. When it talks about with perplexity, isn't that interesting? That has taken on all new meaning. Remember the uh, two-week lockdown for COVID back in March 2020? Now we're going into our halfway through our second year, year. And new waves of, of shutdowns. Right. Countries still... Lockdown and vaccinating uh, mask, double mask, no mask, president, triple mask. The president says he's coming door to door to jab people. Uh, uh, taxes just being uh, just thrown out uh, to raise and to take things away from people, inheritance that they've given their lives for. How about this? How about paying people to stay home when there are businesses begging for workers? Yeah, my son has had a rough year in his business. He's He's been down two men. He usually has a staff of eight to ten. He's been two men down the whole year because he can't get people to come to work. They don't want to come to work. That's. I'm, I'm telling you, there's so many things going on that literally make you scratch your head in amazement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've had to work like an extra 20 hours a week just to keep their business open because uh, there's no laborers. Yep. Yeah. There, <laughs> signs everywhere, but yet our government is still choosing to pay and overpay not just pay but overpay to keep people from working and and it per is listen i'm telling you uh, i mean i understand why they're doing it they're doing it because if they can run the small business if our government can run the small businesses out of business then eventually there's no jobs to be had because the government controls the jobs and the big businesses and small business is the crux of america so if you get rid of the small business guys you you kill the you kill the country yeah and that's what I think is the goal. That's the goal. America is the last nation standing to to oppose globalism, complete dominant global control. And so here we are, men's hearts failing them for yeah. fear and for looking out of those things coming on there with complications with perplexity. That's a very interesting word. It's a very powerful word. Yeah. And people are in the midst of this and they're asking questions uh, like, is it okay to just want to die? Yeah, I mean that's sad, but that's that's the world we're living. Well, in. well, that is the hearts failing them when you no longer have the drive to live, and if you if you pay attention and you're looking at businesses, you got business owners, you got workers, you got people at home, you got people everywhere where they're now they're on prescription meds because they can't handle it. They're on uh, illegal meds. They're on. Um, uh, illegal drugs, they're on alcohol, they're, I mean, you name it, anything they can to medicate the pain away. I've had 50 people tell me in the last six months, I just don't even listen to the news because I can't take can't. it. I can't, can't listen it. to it. I can't take it. So those, that's, that's discouraging. And so this question that they're asking is a, a legitimate, it's a sad, but it's a very yeah. real question. And, uh, we have good news. I just tell people, hey, <laughs> we win in Christ. We win, we win. Right. 
but Jesus said, I'll come to deliver you from this present evil world. And the question that I cannot answer for people is how evil will he allow it to be right. before he comes? I, I, I can't answer that. Well, you have, okay, so we have people that are dying of terminal illness with cancer and so on and so forth. There's a lot of people that are just living in painful conditions right now. There's a lot of people living with intense sadness and intense emotional pain. And families don't know how to help one another anymore. Like, like they don't even know how to help deal with anyone because they're trying to deal with it themselves. And so that when someone else is in pain, rather than get in and try to help, they run mm -hmm. and not intentional, but they don't know what to do. I've had it. I've had a dozen friends, uh, elderly that I've known and love for years and years and years. They're dying in rest homes. They're dying in the hospital. Couldn't even go see them. Right. I did go see one of our dear old Italian guys, uh, um, it, it had to sit outside in the rain through a window at a, at a rest home because they wouldn't let me in. And uh, they, they did allow that. They cracked the window about one inch. So we could hear each other, but I'm outside freezing. But he was just worth it to me. I love him. And right. he was so thrilled that I came to see him. One of those little Italian guys looks both <laughs> ways, you know, <laughs> make sure nobody's listening in on our stuff, you know. And I get Louis down the street to come up and take care of, you know. We know what you, we'll get. We'll take care of you, you know. Just one of my favorite Italian guys in the whole world. He's with the Lord now, but man, it was it was so sad because yeah. he was alone. Yeah, right. right. And there's uh, oh, but that is that's also by design, and that's the other thing that people are are struggling and that's killing them is is this they're alone. They are literally yeah. set apart and left to die. The elderly. Yeah. It is so sad. And the word fear appears in this text. And I, I think that the enemy through the mainstream media and through the whole COVID agenda has uh, spawned a fear yep. that our nation has never known before. Well, here's what's interesting about this passage in verse 26. It says men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming. Mm -hmm. And and so the media has, has given this picture of COVID Fear, 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 right? COVID put you, oh, you can't, listen. Yeah, and you, and by the way, if you haven't been vaxxed, you're the problem. And so yeah. now it's the fear of We're the domestic terrorists and, now. But what's interesting is if you're not vaxxed, you have, or if you're vaxxed, it's the same expectations. I mean, what's the difference? The Cleveland Clinic a couple of weeks ago said those of us who've had COVID, uh, that we have the antibody and we are safe. You're safe. We're we're not going. We're not dangerous to anybody, and we're 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 safe from the virus ourselves. There's nothing better than the the antibody system that God gave us. And so now, and they say that those of us who have the antibody, if we were to take the vax, that we would be three times more likely to be damaged by it right. than than somebody who's never had COVID. Isn't that crazy? And, and so. They talk about science when it's their science, but uh, when it's the Cleveland Clinic science, which up until COVID, Cleveland Clinic was like, they spoke, everybody listen, listened. Listen, Cleveland Clinic set the precedence. Yeah, they raised the bar high. And now when it doesn't agree with their agenda, yeah. Cleveland Clinic doesn't know what they're talking about. So you can compile all this together, whether it's economic, medical, uh, COVID, uh, you know, the southern border, Afghan, all the uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty. Yeah. And the one thing that we need is in the human experience is uh, certainty. Well, because certainty gives us some security. Yeah. Because there's we because now there's an expectation that we can understand whether even if it's bad, it's still uh, you know what to expect. You know what to expect. And uh, so right now, people's hearts are failing them. Well, here's another question: Those who are asking, "Is it wrong to want to die?" and there's and and they ask God to take their life. Is this a form of suicide? Yeah, just it's a sad topic, but uh, there's certainly a biblical framework which we're going to give. Yep. And putting that all together, it, it's a win for those uh, of us in Christ. We don't know how bad God will allow it to be before right. we're taken, but right. we do know this: throughout history, God's grace is always sufficient. We also know that wanting to die and escape from suffering, whether it's emotional or physical, is a very human condition. Mm -hmm. Jesus displayed it in Matthew twenty uh, twenty six thirty nine. You know, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. He's about to go on the cross. He's about to be handed over. Like everything he knew. This is his humanity. <laughs> crying out. It is his humanity. And he goes on and he says this, 
It says, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What we see is we see even Jesus says, oh my, because three times he prayed this. So it, it's natural for the for humanity to say, oh my goodness, I don't want to go through the pain or the trouble or the anguish that I'm about to go through. That is natural. But what he does do is he submits to the Father and he says, nevertheless, it is not what I want, but it is what you want. John 5.30 says this. Jesus says this, I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of the father who sent me. I think that this is the crux of the question. Circumstances get so bad sometimes in people's lives that in despair Mm -hmm. is is now in control. And when we are in despair, we ask these questions. I saw in, our, in my little preparation for our time together, I saw the great prophet Elijah in despair. Yep. After a great victory on Mount Carmel, <laughs> right? Jezebel says, I'm going to, you're, you're going to be dead by tomorrow night. And, uh, and he, and he, he, the wind went out of his spiritual sail. Right. Fear kicked in great prophet Elijah, which is crazy because he just had this huge victory. Yeah. But he got tired <laughs> He was physically exhausted. Yeah. And uh, all of us, there's a straw that breaks every camel's back. Camels are strong, but they, and he was, and, he, and it's funny, God let him flee. Yep. And uh, he let him rest, gave him some food. And uh, he's whining, I'm the only one. There's only, <laughs> I'm the only one. That, and God said, shut there's, up, There's 7,000 more. Get up and go. And he just <laughs> let him get some rest, gave him some good food and said, you ready to go back to work? Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready to go back to work. But he... He was re He prayed a suicidal prayer. He wanted to go. Jonah, right. prophet Jonah, after a great revival, it's the only pagan nation that ever responded to one of the Jewish prophets. And God said, and the entire the entire city, yeah, yeah repented. I, I think there were like 120,000 members uh, or uh, citizens. What history yeah. tells me, and they all got saved. And Jonah was having a pity party, and he wanted to die. <laughs> so. Uh, King Solomon, the whole book of Ecclesiastes is dark. He was <laughs> he's ready to cash in the chips, man. Listen, listen I'm, I'm going to tell you, you read the uh, Ecclesiastes, Solomon makes me want to cut my throat. <laughs> like, I'm like, dude, dude, I can't take you no more. It was dark. <laughs> it was he so was ready. dark. He was praying. It was a near suicidal yeah. condition. Oh, wretched. You know, he said... Yeah. Uh, uh, how did he frame it? Oh, vanity of vanities. Behold, all is vanity. He's at the top. He feels like he's on the bottom. Yeah. Everybody's praising him. He's saying, yeah. shut up. I'm, yeah. I'm a loser. Yeah. I, I just <laughs> want to die. Sort of was, too, wasn't he? Yeah. I just want to die. Yeah. I just want to die. And so if you go through those emotions, well, you're in good company. Mm -hmm. But that's when our faith kicks in. Right. That's when we go to the word of God. And he mm -hmm. told us what to expect in the last days. Yeah. And Why are we surprised? Yeah. So like what is happening in the news that comes as any surprise? And I think Jesus would just smile and say, I got this. Yep. So the interesting thing is if, if we die, we go to be with the Lord. If we live, the Lord's with us. Where's the negative? Say that again. That's sacred. Yeah. If we die, we go to be with the Lord. If and we Paul, live. And Paul said, which is far, far better. Uh, yeah. Right. As far as, listen, I much would rather be with the Lord, but mm -hmm. it is better right now for me to be here with you. So as we look at this, guys, uh, I get it. I get it. You know, we sometimes, and even Paul, that you brought up Paul, even Paul was like, listen, I'd rather be with the Lord. I desire to depart and be with Christ, he said. Yeah. Which is far greater, but it's needful for, for me. me. And the same spirit that made brought him through right. that, right. that same spirit will bring you and I in uh, But even in Jesus had that same spirit. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? Nevertheless, as your will be done, Father. And Paul says, nevertheless, it's, it's, you know what? It's more expedient for me to stay here with you. Uh, and for us, it, we should have the attitude, uh, Lord, I, and believe me, I do. It's like in my heart of hearts, I'm like, Lord, come quickly. I'm already starting to feel better, John. Yeah, right? I'm like, come quickly. But what about those that don't know the Lord? Okay, Lord, use me to reach them. You no. Know? 
I think of Queen Esther, uh, her husband just banished the, the last queen because he wanted her to, his buddies were all drunk at a party and he wanted her to come in and do a lewd dance right. and show off her beauty. And she said, I ain't going to do it. He banished her for being the queen. And then he finds this little Jewish girl, marries her, signs a decree by Haman, didn't even know it. And all the Jews are going to die. And, and then God had Queen Esther in the right place at yep. the right time with the right heart attitude. She had to go in to, to seek audience with the king to try to stop the right. death of the Jewish people. And she said, for such a time as this, yeah. that God had her in the right place at the right time. And you know what? He has us right here. This is our playing field. Yes. This is our time. He told us what to expect. He wasn't lying. Yeah. And his grace has always been sufficient for all these guys in their low time. Elijah was down, but he didn't stay down. Right. I don't know what happened with Jonah. <laughs> I don't know about him. <laughs> he was, he like, was kind of a punk, wasn't he? Was, he? Yeah, he was like, oh, I knew you would do that, God. I knew you would save them. See, and those you, Ninevites, they weren't very nice. <laughs> well, they destroyed his family. Yeah, yeah. And he so was he angry. Reason. He had reason to hate these people. He and but anyway yeah the dark days they come and thank god they go but the lord is moving what a time in history we are yes it's uncertainty as far as but the we're, cash but flow. we're living in biblical times yes we are it, you we say well the times are unsure i'm like yes, well from the but, human vantage point but, but you can read scripture and it's and it un starts unfolding it clearly yeah it's not unsure no. jesus is coming again yeah. The Antichrist is setting up shop. Globalism is almost here. And I get a little caught caught between my patriotism and my Christianity and, hey, 100% Jesus and 50% right. America. Right. Uh, America is not the kingdom that's coming and his will be done. So uh, I love my country, but I love Jesus way more. They are uncertain days, but you know what? They're not uncertain in reality. No. It is certain that Christ will return. Well, and that's the thing. It might be uncertain because it's not exactly the America we're used to, but it's the God we're used to. Uh, oh, Johnny. You get a point for that. <laughs> Listen, I love that. So you're building me up, John. Well, I'm ready to charge hell with a squirt gun. Right. So here's one of the things that I find interesting. And this is why we need to embrace God rather than embrace self. Self will want us cause us to want to die. But none of us are going to die until it's our time. Even if we want to die, we won't be able to die. Psalm 139.16 says this. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. Our days have been fashioned for us. Listen, God when, uh, God uses us. God uh, has chosen us, and now he's going to use us, and he's going to establish us until it is our last day. And our last day won't be done until he's done with yeah. it. It is appointed unto man once, once to, to die. die. God knows that what that time appointment is. Did you ever meet Dr. R. O. Woodworth from the one of the founders of our of our I Bible did College? Not. Yeah, he, he he was a great friend and preached for me many times. And uh, he 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 said, "Well, if I knew where I was going to die, I'd make sure I never went there." <laughs> <laughs> But he did. There's wisdom right there. Then I had an old deacon in my church, Bob Cody. Man, he was our greeter. We love Bob Cody. He was, I always said he's the greatest liar in the whole church. He'd walk in, he'd tell you that you were handsome and debonair. I'm not even sure what that means, but it was a compliment. <laughs> but the handsome thing, I said, Bob, I love you, but you're lying, man. I, I am ugly. But he he was precious, and he had seven bypasses. He still oh holds the church record. Seven heart bypasses. <laughs> And a whole, the record? Yeah, he's got the church record. I don't know what the world record is. We've definitely got our church record. Oh, my goodness. I think the closest we've ever had is quadruple. He's got seven. seven. He's got the record. He held the bar high. And and I was there, and he had a hole in his heart from childhood. He's very limited his whole life because of that. And they finally fixed that hole in his heart. And he was like in his late 60s. He lived on for another eight or ten years and, and with a really improved health. And as I was there when they pulled the respirator off of him in ICU. And I loved him. He loved me. And he whispered, just bear, just getting just enough strength to say, Pastor Duke, when it's our time, no one will be late. Right. But if it's not our time, we're going to be okay. Yeah. And so that is what comforts me. And I think, well, here's the other thing too. I, 
if we're not careful, we're praying the wrong prayer. Instead of praying, uh, Lord, I want to die. How about we pray, uh, God, give me your strength and grace to stand fast, to be salt and light. And help me to understand my days. Yeah, help me. You know I what? love this illustration. I probably used it before on another podcast. But the disciples are out in the boat uh, in the middle of the night. Who put them in the boat? Jesus. Jesus. He's got them right where he wants them. Storm comes. They're fearing for their lives. Is their fear real? Absolutely. Yeah. But a better question, is their fear legitimate? No. Why not? Well, because they're with the Son of God who has shown yeah. himself over and yeah. over and over again. Yeah. And it isn't until we get caught up in our own little crybaby mess that we fail to see the power of God. Yeah. And and what happens is we that's why we got to stay in prayer, we got to stay in church, we got to stay in the word of God, we got to stay plugged into the things of God because if not then Satan will overwhelm us with the fear of the world every time. And you know and and, it's, and not only that but but here's the other thing. Listen, suffering is a part of life. I remember when my mom uh was dying. And I remember in the prayer uh, when my mom was dying and, and it was, I was crushing me to watch my mom go through what she went through. And my prayer was, and I even told my mom, I said, mom, do you know Jesus as your Lord and savior? And she was like, yes, because we had already been through this. And, uh, I said, mom, just ask Jesus to take you home. And then my prayer was Lord, take her home. I don't want to see my mom suffer anymore. And she didn't die then. Um, she ended up getting moved, and then we found out what was wrong, and then we found out it was doctor neglect that put her where she was at, but she had been neglected for so long there was no recovery. Her veins were rupturing. They couldn't carry any more sustenance to her, to her organs. And in the end, uh, you know, ultimately my mom gets unplugged from the machine. She did, said she didn't want to be plugged into the machine. And I had to be the one to make the call. Ouch. And so um, I talked to my mom, and then uh, ultimately the decision was made, you know, unplug the machine, and, and my mom dies. When my mom dies, I do her funeral. It was the first funeral I've ever done. Oh, wow. was my mom's. And uh, one of the hardest things in my life, but one of the biggest blessings in my life is there were over 20 people that came to the knowledge and saving grace of Jesus Christ through my mother's death. Now, my cousins get saved. My aunts, uncles, uh, my uncle got saved. And I remember uh, my uncle Johnny, and man, I loved him. He was so special. And I remember at the end of my mom's sermon or the service, and then you know how you get in line and everybody goes through. And... Um, and my uncle came up to me as he was passing by. He whispers in my ear and he said, I just, he said, he, they, family calls me Johnny. And they said, um, and me too. <laughs> yeah. Fam, I said family. I said family. Thank you. Um, and he said this, he said, Johnny, you didn't see me, but I raised my hand and asked Jesus to be my savior. <laughs> Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord. And I thought, you know, my mom's saved. She's, in heaven. Now my uncle saved. My cousin came up to me and it's like, Johnny, I asked Jesus to be my savior. So all of a sudden I get all these people that ask Jesus to be their savior. And I think, uh, as, and someone asked me one time, how did you feel about that? And I said, you know, knowing that my mom's in heaven, I would trade her for 20 more because I'm going to see her again. You know, I think sometimes we lose perspective on what God is really doing. Suffering is hard. And sometimes the hardest parts is the questions that we have of why. You know, like, why did my mom have to suffer so bad? Do you know how many people I led to the Lord in the hospital when I would visit my mom? Nurses. I, I, even in, there were nurses that came up, and, and we knew my mom was going to die. There, we had already gotten the information that there was no way she would recover. She's going to die. The moment we unplugged the machine, within two minutes, she would be dead. We knew that. The doctors made it clear. And so we're, I was at my mom's bedside. The doctor comes up, and I said, and my mom's coherent. Like her brain was completely intact. It was her body that was done. 
And I said, Doc, um, here's the question. Is my mom going to live? And the doctor said, and my mom was very coherent. Um, and but the doctor said, as long as she stays plugged up to this machine, your mother will live. The moment you unplug the machine, uh, she will be dead within two minutes or less. And the nurse was standing there and the doctor walked away and I looked at my mom and I said, Hey mom, um, I know you heard him and she nodded her head. I said, where are you at with Jesus? Do you know Jesus as your savior without question? And she nodded her head and I looked at the nurse and I said, nurse, thank you for all of your work and taking care of my mom as well as you have. And I said, but it's going to be good. And the nurse said, you know, I see people all the time coming in here claiming faith, faith, faith. But I've never seen them actually live it until now. And I said, well, God is good. And my mom, I'll see her again. And today is just a hard time. You know, like, so, so we're going to go through this. This isn't always going to be a walk in the park. And my mom's been dead. Um, 19 years now, dude, the pain is still fresh. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't always go away. But the moment she hugs you on the other side, all that pain will be forgotten. Well, and here's the other thing, as hard as it is. God's promises are so sweet. And the people that I led to the Lord because of my mother's sickness, and then the people I led to, my mo uh, led to the Lord because of my mother's death. Guys, I, is it hard? Yeah. Is it precious? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Jesus said, I'll be with you. Uh, and, and, and so suffering is hard. Suffering is also humbling. Right? Because sometimes we don't like to be humbled We don't because we don't like weakness. Sometimes we feel this weakness. But the reality is when we are humbled by the promises of God, uh, death isn't the first thing on our list. It's life and how can we make a difference for you, Jesus? Mm -hmm. We like so much to be in control. And, uh, and God says, no, uh, I'm, I'm the one in control here, whether it's the disciples out on the sea and of course, Jesus, three words, peace be still, and everything was fine. And they felt like blithering idiots, you know. Right. So, or, you know, he's walking on the water. He already had under his feet what threatened to be yeah. over their heads. He was in control of the situation. There, your mom is dying. God says, I'm going to use her valiantly. So, and that's, that is the thing is, listen, whatever happens, God has a purpose for that suffering. Mm -hmm. And since God owns us, he has the right. He has the right to do whatever he chooses mm -hmm. and, and how he chooses. And it will always work together for good. It will. Psalm 1830 says this. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Listen, God's way is perfect. His desire is perfect. His plan is perfect. And how sweet it is. And you think about this, right? There were over 20 people, over 20 people that accepted Christ as their savior because of my mother's illness and ultimately because of her death. How sweet is it that God used my mom to bring a multitude into heaven's gates for, for eternity? Mm -hmm. God, thank you. That's how he works. Thank you that my mother's Life and death was not in vain. Like this is where we should be plugging into rather than that inward selfishness. God, use me. God, use them. And then God, use me to help them use you. He knew what was happening. And he, he's, he's in the shadows. And then sometimes he steps from the shadows to the to the front stage. You know, I had probably one of the darkest, hardest moments I ever went through was having a kidney stone attack in Bolivia. Oh, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> it's crazy. I was taken at 6 a.m. to this little clinic that opened up. The doctor was about five foot four and he 
did not speak a word of English, and I muy poquito español, very, very little, and I am in a, intense pain. Nobody was there yet, and they take me to this back little room. The table's about four and a half feet long. For Bolivians aren't real big, right. and I'm six foot, <laughs> and so that was interesting. I'm on this little bed, and it wasn't clean, and they didn't have any medication there, so we had to wait for the, th- and I'm in horrific pain. You know, phase one, you're afraid you're going to die. Phase two, you're afraid you're not going to die. <laughs> right. And when you're in pain, and I speak to our audience here, when you're in pain, whether it's emotional, spiritual, physical, really all you can think about is not being in pain anymore. And right. you're desperate. Right. And that, uh, that's the key, that's the word, man. People, people desperate. get desperate. I was scared. Yeah. I was desperate. And then I realized God has me right where he wants me. And I'm thinking, I'm serving you, Lord. I'm here in Bolivia. Why would you let this kidney stone tack hit me here? Because I was really fearful for the medical stuff. They give me an IV. I don't know how many times that needle's been used before, right. but it's in my arm now. And uh, <laughs> they didn't have the medication. So the, the missionary uh, gal had to take a taxi, wait till 8 o'clock when a, uh, a pharmacy would open up, get the medication, bring it back. And he just ripped, took a pair of scissors and ripped open the bag, poured the medication into the bag, and into my veins it went, and it 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 worked. The pain went away. I saved the I saved the little box and everything, and brought it home and showed it to my doctor. You know what my doctor told me? He treated you perfectly. Isn't that? God was just doing exactly the right thing through this little Bolivian doctor. He had a lack of resources, but he was fine. He knew what he was doing. And Isaiah fifty five eight through nine. Quote it, man. Or read it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Mm-hmm. See, my faith was this big, but God's grace was this big. Right, right. And he was looking out for me, and it was amazing. I, The medication took away the pain. And then uh, I was there. I got there at 6 a.m. and I, I left it. Uh, I left at 10:30 a.m. I was there four and a half hours, and uh, the medication took care of the pain. I'm, you know, I, I turned out to pass the stone, but as I'm, the hardest time was when I walked out of the clinic. There was a long hallway with chairs on both sides, a little narrow hallway that was probably three feet between, and then people sitting on both sides. On every chair was two to three people kids sitting on mother's wow. laps and stuff and they were waiting and probably wouldn't even i don't know how one doctor could see all those people in a day and then i had that clinic room for four and a half hours to myself and they chart you know i was the only one probably in the whole room with any money and the bill for that was like 13 dollars and 50 cents isn't that crazy 13 bucks and i think i gave him a seven or 650 tip and threw him down a 20 spot and I, i'll never forget walking through that hallway, you know, here I am worried and complaining and why me? And I got treated and God got me through it. But I, I saw these people that they don't have any money. Right. They might not get treated. They may die and it, it humbles me, but I do know what despair is. I know what fear is. Um, and even though my faith was, I might have got a C minus that day on <laughs> right, <laughs> but grace got an A plus. Amen. And at the end of the day, yeah. I look back on it and say, God, you were bigger than I ever guessed. Well, you know, and here's the other thing too, is, is Paul had the right attitude um, in second Corinthians 12, seven through 10. Cause let's, let's face it. Paul was struggling. He was suffering with, sure. with some things. It says verse seven, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul had already understood that, you know what? God allowed suffering to come in to keep his focus, to keep Paul's focus on on God, right? And Paul says, listen, uh, unless I thought way too much of myself, God made sure that he kept me humbled. Verse 8. It says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, therefore, 
I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I think rather than seeking to escape from suffering, we need to have the attitude of Paul and say, okay, in my weakness, you will be shown, but in my weakness and you being shown will be my strength. You have those divine moments when that happens. Yeah. And then you're left speechless. You're left in the awe of, of this amazing God that he does the right thing for us, even though our emotions were a little, a little weak. There's nothing new under the sun. God makes it clear that other believers have suffered pain. Other believers have suffered persecution. Other believers uh, have been lonely and abandoned. We're not alone, and God is always faithful. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The problem is, as Americans, and man, I hate to say this on a podcast with such a heavy topic, but we've really become wimps. Yeah, we're spoiled. We are so spoiled, we've become brats. Spiritually, I think that's very true. We think we are entitled to a, a better, better, uh, I don't deserve this. Who I don't do. And it's like, then who does? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You deserve a break today. McDonald's sold a lot of burgers on. It's like, no, we really, uh, God's holiness and justice requires that we would really go to hell, but grace was waiting. Yeah. And, and that's what, and guys, listen, I get it. I really understand. Boy, have I walked in pain before and have I had struggles before and am I struggling now? I mean, dude, I got a phone call today. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, dude. One of those phone calls that makes me glad I'm no longer a lead pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, I went, oh, like it just took the life out of me, but I got to deal with it. Why do I got to deal with it? Because God's called me to deal with it. It's not fun. It's not pleasurable. And, and <sighs> just comes in from nowhere. Not members from the church. Uh, just uh, it's probably best not to go into details on yeah. that here. But it was, it's just one of those heart-rending things that you yep. want to help. And yet, you know, in this world, when you give this kind of help, you're going to be called. <laughs> you can. You're going to be labeled something uh, that's opposite of a helper. In this situation, it's going to come down to do I listen to God or man? Mm-hmm. Do I, be do I want or politically correct? Yeah. And I have to be biblical. Yeah. I, I don't have a choice, dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But man, the, 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 the broken heart in the process is yeah. I, I'm, I'm dreading it. But, but you're going to have, have an experience in the Lord because when he puts us on the hot seat, uh, he's with us yeah. and words will be given to you. They'll be gracious and some people that are really, really hurting and really right. in darkness and really in bondage are going to have a loving pastor open up hard, but biblical truth are going to stand them. before God one day and give account of yeah. the things. Yeah. And uh, God puts you strategically in that spot, just like Queen Esther uh, for, for that issue, God's putting about you on that. a hot spot uh, today. Well, and, but, and, and, here's, and here's a promise that I have. No temptation has taken me except for where it's taken someone else before. Yeah, you're not the Lone Ranger. I am not the Lone Ranger like Elijah thought he was. Yeah, there's still 7,000 having there's, bowed their knee to Biden. That's right. <laughs> you know, and like it's like, look, you're not the first one that's had to deal with this. You won't be the last one that's had to deal with this. And this may not be the last time you have to deal with this, but suck it up, big boy. I'm with you wherever you go yeah. and deal with it. Yeah, put your big boy pants on and stand as up as a man. And, and with a breaking heart, we give truth because only truth can set people free. You can give people what they want, make them happy, and they wind up standing before God totally unprepared one day. Right. And our job is not to tickle people's ears, but to well, ready people up. Here's the other thing. What an opportunity I have. As hard as this is going to be, and quite possibly heartbreaking as this is going to be, there could be a flip side where 
people get saved through this. That's how God often works. And so we just do the right thing and leave the results with him. And that's what I'm going to do. And uh, what I also have to remember, and this is to to deal with the question, right? <sighs> is it wrong to ask to want to die? I, I don't think it's wrong to want to die. Paul said, Lord, I want to be with you. But, hey, guys, it's better that I stay here. And uh, the truth is, Romans 14, 13 says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. Guys, that's the key right there. You know what? No matter what we do, it's got to be from faith. And if it's not from faith, then it is sin. So now we got to look at this and God is, you know what? Is, is this sinful of me to want to die? Well, I think to a degree it is because wanting death is selfishness rather than God use, use my suffering for your honor and glory. And, and so, and I'm not, listen, I'm not condemning you for wanting to die. I'm just simply saying that is, is it really a faith or is it a selfish desire to just want to check out? Because the truth is there's times where we just want to check out and, and it's not what God has for us and we know it. And so I think it becomes sin. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about, uh, your mother, the, uh, the, the last, uh, hours, last weeks of, of life are difficult. It's going to be that way. It's appointed and a man wants to die. And um, a lot of the dignity has been taken out of death uh, yeah. because, and I'm all for uh, modern medical science and prolonging life, but you know, there's a quality of life that when that's gone, you start to say, is that life at all? And I think modern medicine is kind of, um, taken a lot of the dignity out yeah. of death. You know, I want to prolong my life, but I don't want to prolong agony. Right. And, and that's what's happening. A lot of this modern medicine is just allowing people to live where they would have died and would have been better off to have died 10 years sooner than what they did. Yeah, modern medicine saved me numerous times. I had kidney stones that would have killed me on four occasions because they were too big to pass. I would have got an infection. I would have died. My kidney and my uh, appendix burst. I would have died. I got a staph infection and a surgical wound, Achilles tendon repair, and uh, that uh, staph infection would have killed me. So there's four or five, six times mm -hmm. I would have died plus pneumonia without, without uh, penicillin. I would have died. So I could have been dead easy seven times that I can count, not count the stupid times. <laughs> Listen, I'm not even going to tell you how many times I know God spared me from my stupidity. Yeah. But, uh, and so I'm very grateful, but see that, that medicine, those surgeries, that therapy brought me to, to life. Right. And I'm all for that. But when somebody is on such a decline, to where there is no uh, hope, right? Then, uh, then I start having you know theological questions arise, and those are real. Like as a pastor, to deal with that, and and when people are like, "Hey, pastor, is it okay?" Or do you think that you know you already know? For example, they have Alzheimer's or dementia, and they're they're mentally they're gone, but they're going to live for ten more years in this dark place. Yeah. I was on a commission for Albany Med a number of years ago, kind of on a medical ethics, and they wanted to have a biblical pastoral voice in on this. And uh, some of the doctors didn't really like what I had to say because they were going to lose a lot of money. Right. You know, and I'm all about life and quality of life. But when when somebody's not going to get better. You and, know it. You know, especially in Christ, because heaven doesn't scare me much anymore. I'm 67 right. years old. and. You know, and my, my precious wife said, if it's, he's ready to call me home, I'm ready to go. Right. You know, and, uh, and this is not a suicidal thought at all, but, uh, well, I can see where these ethical questions arise. And if, if I'm, and I've had this talks with my wife, if, if I can't get better and they're plugging me in to keep me alive, no. you know, uh, Get together. Well, well, how about this, man? You know what? An animal is struggling, and what is what's the first thing we do? We take them to the vet or whatever, and they'll inject them and stop their heart from beating and put them down. Um, That's called mercy when it's with animals. Right. But with people, we won't do that because then they call it murder. But the reality is they're living in a shell anyway. Mm -hmm. 
And so, and, and again, people, listen, people may not agree with me on this. I, I get it. Well, and let them each man be convinced in their own no. mind. The scriptures say, right. You know, my wife and we've had this talk and we have it in writing. We have a, a, a I forget what you call it, the medical. Yeah, no DNC. And, and do not resuscitate. Do not resuscitate. DNR. Well, the, DNR. I, 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 I have a resuscitation if I'm in an accident and they can resuscitate me to get me back on my feet again. But if I got some kind of chronic thing and everything's shutting down, then unplug the machine. Send me home. Right? I'm ready to go. Right. Country roads sent to take me home. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I guess now it comes down to if we're going to answer the question, James 4.17 Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Is it okay to pray to die? I prayed for my mom to die. Mm -hmm. Not because I wanted her dead, but because there was no reversing where she was at. Mm -hmm. uh, I, is that sinful? I don't, I don't think so. And there are other people that I've prayed to die. Lord, take them home. Do not allow them to suffer anymore. Lord, end this, please. Quickly, end this. That's not sinful because there's no, there's no return. There's no, there's no benefit to staying alive, I guess is my point. So when is it okay to pray to die or ask to die? I think when quality of life is no longer. Now, you know that. You know when that is and you know what that is. Now, is it quality of life because you're inconvenienced? It's, it's not quality or, or is it no quality of life because... It's just no quality. My mom would have had to live on a machine. That's no quality because she would have been laid in bed, eyes closed or open. She couldn't talk. All the, you know, I mean, there's no quality whatsoever of life in that my mother did not want to live on a machine. And so, therefore, it's okay to want to die and unplug. And she knew Jesus as her Savior. Mm -hmm. If there is any kind of mental ability to understand then confirm salvation in people's heart and you don't want them to die without Jesus. Other than that, if quality of life is nothing. Yeah. There's a word that appears numerous times in, in Paul's writings is the word ready. I am ready yeah. to depart. You know, that divine readiness. He was ready to preach the gospel to those that were at Rome. But then there came a time when his body was so beaten down and he was so sick and literally blind, he was ready to depart and be with yeah. Christ. That wasn't a, a sinful prayer. It wasn't a suicidal prayer. It was a, a completion prayer. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, I know that readiness. I have a little a one year, almost one year old grandson. He's so ready to start walking. And I have a granddaughter that's so ready to start school. Friday's her first day uh, coming up. Tomorrow will be her first day. She's so ready. And she's so ready to ride that bicycle up and down the driveway. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I got a grandson that's so ready to play drums in, in the church worship team. And he's already doing that. And, you know, I have a, a granddaughter so ready to graduate from high school and, you know, and then they'll be so ready to get married and so ready to uh, get that career going. And they're ready to, my son's ready to b build that dream house. And, and Papa here, I'm so ready right. <laughs> to depart and be with Christ. No, I've got, I feel I have so, quite a few miles left in this. And, uh, but that's you, to your point is, listen, everybody's ready for different stages in life. Yeah. And when it's time for death, You'll not, be ready. Yeah, it's not scary. You'll be ready. and But until then, uh, understand this, that there's only, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, James 4, 17, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Listen, if you got life in you and you're praying to die, that's sinful because God still wants to use you and you're still a fit vessel. Uh, there, But there's only one sin that keeps us out of heaven. That's the sin that we have to clarify. But I think when people clarify this, and that is that one, you have to become a child of God. Once you become a child of God because you believe on Jesus Christ, now you you your desire is to be that which God would have you to be rather than your desire to, of selfishness. It's God, just use me. Use me, use me, use me, use me. Uh, whatever that looks like. And even for Paul, you know, my desire is to be with the Lord, but it's more beneficial for me to be with you. What was the difference with Paul? He was Christ-focused, not self-focused. But he acknowledged where he was at. Mm-hmm. But he also acknowledged that he's willing to submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit rather than the selfish desire of himself. 
It's interesting. Uh, Paul dies, is closing the book of Acts, closes out with Paul dying. It doesn't just use the, the exact words, but Paul dies by beheaded, be, being beheaded in Rome. And yet he was ready. And uh, he, the whole mood of that last chapter is totally upbeat because the gospel, <laughs> yeah. you know, that Roman sinful Roman yeah. thing is all coming down, but the church of Jesus Christ is still here today. Right. Last time I was in Rome, I was teaching the next generation of Christian leaders right on the pagan grounds where they stood in condemnation of the apostle Paul. You know, Jesus is, Paul's Jesus was greater than the Roman gods. Guys, here's where it comes down to. Is it sinful to want to die? I think that praying to God to allow you to die is sin uh, because doing so indicates lack of faith. And selfishness. And it's selfishness. Not because you want to die, but because is it the right time to die? Or is it just a matter that you want to check out? I'm going to tell you that God wants us to live and he wants us to live life and he wants us to live life abundantly and he wants us to do it in his standard his time his grace his strength his power his deliverance our prayer should be uh, god you've promised to sustain me through any trial Mm -hmm. god nothing is new under the sun I beg that you take away my hopelessness and that you give me strength to walk and walk in your glory, your strength, so that people see you, Jesus, and not me. I think if we pray that prayer and walk in that walk, that God will be glorified, you'll be strengthened, and your desire to die will wane. Then your desire to be with Jesus, whether here on earth or in heaven, is what matters, but we won't expedite that. Guys, I hope this has helped. And if it has, please like, share, subscribe, and follow. And until next week, God bless.